the greatest men of the 20th century finally get some mainstream recognition, or at least that's the plan. You're watching Beyond the Trailer's review of The Imitation Game. Helen, you do not have to do this alone. What are you doing? What, what's going on? The Navy thinks that one of us is a Soviet spy. You've got more secrets than the best of them. What if I don't fancy her in that way? Can't tell anyone, Ellen. It's illegal. I'm just a mathematician. Sometimes it is the people who no one imagines anything of who do the things that no one can imagine. Right now, you're watching this video on your computer, be it a desktop, laptop, or your phone, which is actually now a computer. In fact, Beyond the Trailer is a web show made specifically for computers. And none of this would likely exist without the work of Alan Turing. Who? Ah, and that's exactly the problem, as both Turing's professional life and personal life were not something the British government wanted you to know about. Professionally, he was a codebreaker at the famed Bletchley Park during World War II. Turing not only broke the Nazi code, but did so with a machine that he invented, which would eventually become the modern-day computer. Personally, Turing was gay at a time when homosexuality was considered a criminal offense in the UK. It's important for you to discover Turing's fate yourself while watching this film, but know that what the British government did to him, the same government who hired him as a codebreaker, was so atrocious that in 2009, Prime Minister Gordon Brown issued an official public apology. And then in 2013, the Queen granted him a posthumous pardon. And who better to portray Alan Turing than a man who has quickly become a British icon himself, Benedict Cumberbatch? But guess what? Leonardo DiCaprio was originally set to play Turing for Warner Brothers, yet decided to pass on this script. How many close calls with Oscar does this guy have to have? Yes, the imitation game is considered a hot Oscar contender, not just because of the subject matter and star, but because it's being carefully shepherded by Oscar whisperer Harvey Weinstein. Yet the portrayal of another brilliant British mind, Stephen Hawking in The Theory of Everything, has also emerged as a hot competitor for this year's Oscars. Ironically, Cumberbatch himself portrayed Hawking back in 2004 for the BBC, for which he received his first BAFTA nomination. Both he and fellow Brit Eddie Redmayne will almost certainly be nominated for Best Actor at almost every award ceremony this year, yet right now Redmayne is favored to win. Yes, while he is a huge hit on the small screen, Cumberbatch has had some difficulty transitioning to the big screen. This was supposed to help considerably, but then Redmayne came along. Behind the camera is Norway's Morten Tildum, making his English language debut here. Tildum got on Weinstein's radar by directing the most successful native film of all time in Norway, corporate thriller Headhunters. This is also the very first feature-length screenplay by Graham Moore, which topped Hollywood's famed Blacklist in 2011. So, will Alan Turing and Benedict Cumberbatch finally get the widespread recognition they deserve? Or will they continue to only be niche figures in both science and entertainment? So, now having actually seen The Imitation Game, I can actually totally understand why Leonardo DiCaprio ultimately passed on this and why it's having a very hard time getting any traction with award season. My biggest problem above and beyond with The Imitation Game is that it doesn't give you any emotional connection to Alan Turing. You could go right now and read his Wikipedia page and you would feel the same way about him as if you watched this movie. It doesn't do anything to flesh out his character. Uh, basically, it's just the Big Bang Theory meets Downton Abbey. And yes, I think this is more of a TV movie than something that's worth seeing on the big screen. It's not particularly cinematic, especially with how good TV is getting. And that's something we discuss a lot here on Beyond the Trailer, uh, how television is getting so good that it really is forcing movies to evolve. And The Imitation Game is really old school award movie uh, filmmaking like 101. It has all the tricks and it's just, it's so formulaic that you can see that it's formulaic. Uh, now, obviously a big part of this movie is Alan Turing's homosexuality. But I think the movie makes a really odd choice and that it really doesn't focus on it that much until like the last third of the film. And then it starts to seem forced, just tacked on. Uh, for instance, 
two of the characters in the movie, I won't, I won't tell you which two, uh, but when Alan Turing says, you know, I, I'm a homosexual to them, uh, they go, oh, you know, totally saw it, sensed it, I, I, was, I guessed it a long time ago. And watching the movie, you're like, really? When? Because I didn't see any evidence of him being gay. And it's not that he had to act a certain way, but he never looked at anyone for a certain, like, too long a period of time. There was just nothing to the point where it's actually somewhat insulting. If I were Alan Turing, I'd be like, what on earth made you think I was gay? Uh, and it, the only thing that could possibly point to it is they're like, well, you're really socially awkward and you don't fit in anywhere or get along with anybody. And that does not mean that, that somebody is gay. Uh, so I thought that was an, an odd choice uh, by the film. And also to not fully explore this part of Alan Turing's life, to just kind of sweep it under the rug, uh, makes no sense, considering the fact that this was clearly such a big part of Alan Turing's life. Obviously, it was half of his life. It was his personal life. It caused tremendous problems for him because of the time and place that he lived, uh, and it had a huge, horrible effect on his life. So to not fully explore that, I think, is not fair to Alan Turing, and, you know, it's almost like the, the wrongs done to him seem to be almost to some degree continuing. Uh, it, it's just unfortunate. And then as for his work, um, they do a pretty good job exploring it, but then Towards the end of the film, it's a spoiler, I don't want to give it away, but there's a, there's a decision that has to be made by Turing and his group uh, about a certain, you know, um, group of civilians. A very controversial decision is made. And it leads to a very controversial and secretive uh, long-term strategy with the war going forward with their group. And it's just, it's, it confirms everybody's worst fears about the government being uh, manipulative, and, uh, and just outright lying and not caring about the lives of its citizens, you know, not putting that first. It just confirms all the worst fears that people have, uh, the worst fears that we have about our government. Uh, and it's just glossed over to the point where you hear it and you're like, wait a minute, are you saying what I think you're saying? And to not focus more on that, I think is careless of the film. Uh, also not to really, you know, make their case for this because if, it, if it's true, it's a huge reveal about how uh, England fought the war and its relationship with its allies and even the very nature of government itself and uh, these clandestine services like MI6 and the CIA. Uh, it's just so huge and just so shocking that I when I heard it, as I said, I was like, let's rewind. And I was also like, there's your movie. Because we've already explored Bletchley Park quite a bit on the small screen and the big screen. And there's been a lot of movies and television shows about the persecution, the wrongful persecution, obviously, of um, you know the gay community. So while that's obviously a very important story, this is also huge and it's new and it's something that hasn't been quite explored, especially you know with the uh, the Greatest Generation. You know this whole idea uh, in World War II and everything was supposed to be really black and white and you know we were fighting an obvious evil. You know the Nazis and to, to ha see such um to have someone just open the door and reveal so many grays, some of them quite murky, is uh, shocking. And it just does pull some focus from the film. And it's easy to pull focus from the film because there's not much of a film there. I would say to go and see this movie, I think it's really only for diehard Benedict Cumberbatch fans, at least in theaters. And everybody does a very nice job. Keira Knightley's very good in the movie. Um, I, I think that there's, it's not helped by the fact that it has so many BBC uh, actors. Uh, there's someone from... Uh, 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 Selfridges, there's someone from Game of Thrones, there's someone from Downton Abbey, you know, it's almost like a little bit of a, a game itself, you know, Alan Turing loved games, uh, or puzzles, and here's one spot the BBC actor, or the, you know, or ITV, I guess, as well. Uh, but I would say, you know, it, it's a fine, it's a handsomely mounted film for the small screen, and I think that's where it's best watched, and I think that Alan Turing deserves a better movie, and it's unfortunate, as I said, that the wrongs to him and the, the the categorization and trying to put him in a box is still being done. They're still trying to put Alan Turing uh, in a neat little box instead of just exploring the very complicated and genius man, an extraordinary and unique man that he actually was. So that's my review of The Imitation Game. If you've seen it, please leave your thoughts down below. I know it's a very popular film in the UK, so I'm curious to what you guys think of it and if you like it or you don't like it, and if you do, what you think I'm not getting about it. Uh, thank you for tuning into my review, and you can check out some more episodes right now.